Hello! Uh, today I'm going to talk about possible historical truths hidden in myth and legend with special emphasis on Odin and the institution of sacred marriage in connection to kingship inauguration. Now, uh, we do not know exactly how old Odin is uh, as a god. Uh, the first evidence for his cult date back almost 2000 years, but I will take us still further back in time to the Bronze Age. Now, I'm not an archaeologist, so what I'm saying now is based on the book called uh, The Chariot of the Sun and Other Rites and Symbols of the Northern Bronze Age, published in 1969 by Peter Gelling and Hilda Ellis Davidson. In their book, Gelling and Davidson analyzed rock paintings made by Bronze Age people in Scandinavia dating between 1800 and 500 BC, which is roughly the era of the Bronze Age in Scandinavia. Uh, Gelling and Davidson concluded that there was substantial evidence that, despite the existence of other deities and powers, there were four major deities which completely dominated the religious scene, and uh, at the center was the worship of the sun. Countless images of the show the sun disk in uh, some mythical situation, and countless others show people worshipping the sun disk in all kinds of ways. Uh, the sun was worshipped by warriors parading with their sun disc shields and weapons and the sun was carried as an emblem above the priests heads and fastened with sticks to people's hands like, like this and uh, the sun was worshipped by um, acrobats and dancers most of whom were female and often performing aboard a ship sacred to the sun um, Gelling and Davidson do not conclude about the sun's gender in the Bronze Age, but suggest that it may have been female or at least androgynous, because it is often shown as being penetrated and um, or adored by a man with a very um, passionate expression that may not in any way be misunderstood. And the conclusion is that the sun disc often engaged in sexual activities with male gods or worshippers. Um, personally, I think it is obvious that the sun in the Bronze Age was a goddess, since absolutely all the Nordic and Germanic languages named the sun as a female from the very beginning, uh, and because in later times Sul of Scandinavia and Sunna of Germany were clearly goddesses. Snorri counted Sul, the sun, among the Åsynjur, the goddesses, and in the poetic Edda, it is said that the son gives birth to a daughter who will follow in the mo her mother's path. And the sun goddess is also important in creation, where um, when she, she comes from the south and gathers all the horses of heaven, which I guess are the planets, with her right hand, whatever that means, and then begins to shine on the rocky surface of the earth goddess, who then brings forth life. Another reason for claiming that the Bronze Age sun was a goddess is the fact that all its attributes, chariot, ship and spirals, are all attributes of the northern goddesses, who are always described as bright, golden white, golden red, shining, bright, bringing forth rays of light and rays of lightning, and um, not to say Freya, who weeps tears of gold and who owns the Brisinga men, which means the jewel of the flames, which I take to be a Haiti for the sun. So, we have a Bronze Age scenario in Scandinavia where a sun goddess was at the center of public festivities, worshipped by men doing warrior dances and women doing acrobatics, and priests walking in procession with the ladies' disc and spiral emblems. Next to this goddess, three male gods, very obviously male, no doubt about it, basically. Uh, ancient Scandinavians were even less demure than modern ones. Well, three very male and, let us say, very um, virile gods take up the flanks around the golden lady, interacting with her, uh, having sex with her, and carrying her emblem on their bodies, on their shields, or above their heads like priests. That these gods were sort of divine or supernatural priests is very likely. Not only do they appear like worshippers and as lovers of the sun goddess, uh, so that they could be taken for priests, but they are also larger than life and have their own emblems or attributes, so that they must be recognized as gods at the same time. In this light, I think it is significant that Snorri actually called the Aesir gods for priests. The gods, according to Snorri, were hofgodir and blutgodir, which means temple priests and sacrificial priests. 
And both in Edda and Skaldic poetry we encounter Aesir gods in the act of performing sacrifice and ritual incantations in honor of powers even greater than themselves. Um, the three male gods are recognized by their attributes and emblems which sometimes take their place. Uh, a virile giant-sized man wielding an axe or just the image of an axe as his emblem representing him is called the axe god by Gilling and Davidson. Then there is the sword god who is an equally virile man wielding a sword and or he's just represented by the sword emblem on its own. And finally there is the spear god represented by the spear as an emblem or by a huge man wielding a spear. Um, Gelling and Davidson pointed out that the three Bronze Age gods are symbolized by attributes that belong clearly to later Norse gods of the Viking Age. Um, the axe god would be an early predecessor of Thor, the thunder god, the one god whom we know existed in Europe and Asia at least 5000 years ago. Knowing this, it is very reasonable to assume that the ancient thunder god is identical with the axe-wielding god of the Bronze Age rock carvings. Um, the sword god could be an early predecessor of Freyr, an assumption which is powerfully strengthened by the fact that the sword god is often associated with pigs or boars, as well as horses, which were later animals sacred to Freyr. And then there is the spear god. We know that um, the god Odin's favorite weapon was the spear and that his spear symbolizes his choices. When he points or hurls his spear at someone, it is to choose them for his own. So is this proof that the gods Thor, Freyr and Odin were worshipped already almost 4000 years ago in Scandinavia? No, no, it's not proof, uh, but as Jelly, Gelling and Davidson suggest, um, it is quite remarkable that the three major male deities of the Bronze Age pantheon share the primary attributes of the three major male deities of the Viking Age, namely axe hammer, sword and spear. Um, this is hardly coincidental and could at least be evidence that the three Viking Age gods as well as the goddess Freya inherited some central symbols associated with a much older religion dating back almost 4000 years. Uh, now, is there any other evidence that the Viking Age religion is based on a Bronze Age prototype? Not really as far as I know, but we could turn to Snorri's tales in the Edda and the Heimskringla. Now, from a modern point of view, Snorri was not a great historian. In fact, when I studied Norse literature, one of my co-students asked if there could be any real foundation for Snorri's historical approach to the origin of the Norse gods. Our tutors immediately warned us to never go there if we wanted an academic career. To claim that there is any historical basis to Snorri's tale whatsoever would be an academic suicide. Um, some of us tried to ask why exactly, pointing out that well, Thor Heyerdahl had tried to excavate evidence uh, about this but had to stop digging because of, uh, well, due to lack of funding. Now the answer was that Thor Heyerdahl was a mock scientist and should never be referred to by serious scholars. So I later figured out what exactly was the reason why Snorri's tale are not believed by modern scholars. It is said that his tales bear evidence of a European medieval tradition of claiming classical ancestry in order to glorify, his one, glorify one's past, with no real basis in history whatsoever. Well, since I'm not going to pursue an academic career, I dare to go where no serious scholar is allowed to tread. I do not believe that Snorri's tale is actual history, but I believe that there may indeed be shreds of truth in it, shreds of ancient memories. Um, we know that myths and legends can be transmitted orally over thousands of years, and that they sometimes refer to historical events. So why not, really? And so what is all the fuss about? Snorri claimed that Odin was a prince of Troy, a Bronze Age city in Anatolia, present-day Turkey. Uh, he was there married to a clairvoyant woman called Frigida, and they were descendants of Thor, the thunder god, and his clairvoyant wife Sibylla, hence the Viking Age Sif. If there is any trace of real history in this tale, I would suggest that what could be the reality behind the legend is that there were a people 
uh, dwelling in the southeast, possibly Anatolia, possibly even Troy, as Noe suggests. Um, a people who worshipped the ancient thunder god and his wife and saw themselves as their uh, descendants. And the Odin of this legend may be covering for a distant memory of a certain leader, general or king who claimed to be the descendant of the thunder god. Even more likely, Odin in this legend is a singular archetypal representation of many such leaders who were all seen as incarnating a divine king while holding the royal office. I actually think that this is quite likely and I will explain why later. Um, in Snorri's tale, Odin leads his people on a quest towards the lands of the north, uh, conquering some people, marrying into other people, spreading their language and their religion, uh, which was strongly based on good old-fashioned old pagan and pagan sorcery and shamanism. And only when they came to the land of the wise Vanir did they meet real resistance, but managed to make a truce with the Vanir. And soon the two divine tribes blended in friendship and marriage, instigating an era of peace and prosperity and wisdom to everyone. This was also when their religions blended. The goddess of the Vanir and her three male companions became members of the Aesir tribe. The Aesir, according to Snorri, were so called because they came from Asia. Now, could there be any truth in this story? Again, I shall blaspheme against the ruling paradigm and say that yes, there is likely a shred of truth in it. Uh, let us ask the first question. Is it likely that a people led by some kind of Odin-like figure, or worshipping a divine prototype of Odin, descendant of the Thunder God, incarnated in their kings, who did move from the southeast to the northwest and came to dominate uh, the cultures of northern Europe? Certainly. Uh, we have to go back a bit before the Scandinavian Bronze Age into the late Neolithic, that is, we have to go back about 4,000 years from now, to find plenty of evidence that a new culture did indeed spread over time beginning in the southeast of Europe and moving slowly to the northwest during the millennium preceding the Scandinavian Bronze Age. It is not unlikely that they may have eventually brought the Bronze Age with them since the Bronze Age began a lot earlier in the southeast than in the northwest. The new invading culture was completely different from the old one. The old culture of Scandinavia during the late Neolithic uh, period was a megalithic, clan-based culture. It was communal and egalitarian, as we see that no individual was significantly elevated above others. Uh, this is shown both in graves, where everybody, no matter what gender or age or status in, in the tribe, were buried as equals in big communal clan graves. And we also see it in their dwellings, which show that everybody in the clan lived together in the same big house. Um, they were peaceful and there is uh, no evidence for war, at least. And they were matrilineal, which we know because of modern DNA. The women of the burials are all related, whereas the men came from the outside. Uh, this means that the women remained within their clans their whole lives, together with their mothers, sisters, aunts, grandmothers and cousins and fathers. Uh, the men, on the other hand, had to move into the clan of the wife and thus had to live and deal with the in-laws for the rest of their lives. So um, we do not know much about their gender relations as, uh, as said, the graves and buildings bear evidence of basic equality. But in such a society it is likely to assume that the women were the backbone of the clan, those who did not change or move away and could expect the support of their families in everyday life every day and thus most probably had a very strong position. Uh, I think personally that the cult of the ancestral mothers that was still so strong in the Viking Age may very well have been a remnant of this ancient megalithic culture. The new invading culture was completely different from the older culture insofar as it was hierarchical, caste-based, caste, 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 caste-based, uh, warlike and patriarchal. And during the Bronze Age, these two cultures blended and compromised. And I think that the truce between the Aesir and the Vanir of Norse myths may likely reflect this historical event. This merging may also explain the institution of the sacred marriage, where a king had to marry the ancestral mother of the tribe in order to legitimize his rule. 
Um, what we do have to dismiss completely, however, is the idea that this invasion happened during the lifetime of one king called Wudan or Udin. Archaeology shows that the spread of their warrior culture happened slowly over many generations. What is possible, however, is that they did worship a Wudan Odin figure and that their kings were seen as living incarnations of this god. Married to a clairvoyant goddess, as Snorri explained, that all the kings of Troy, from Thunar to Wudan, were married to clairvoyant women. The earliest known hard evidence for a Wudan cult does indeed picture the god as married to a fate knowing goddess, and we will come back to that later. Second question is, if a particular culture that worshipped a king god and a clairvoyant goddess did indeed move up to dominate northern cultures before the onset of the Bronze Age, could they have come from Troy or thereabouts? Well, that is pure speculation, but it's not impossible. Troy was a big town already by 3000 BC, so the place already existed by the time of the south to north migration of the new culture. The migration could technically have begun there, and there is no doubt whatsoever that there were strong cultural connections between the Bronze Age Trojans, their Greek counterparts, and the Scandinavian culture during the Bronze Age. No doubt whatsoever, and there must be a reason for why Bronze Age cultures all over Europe had so much in common. Migration from Anatolia to Scandinavia just before the Bronze Age began is a very probable reason. Um, third question is, what about the Vanir tribe who met the Aesir with such resistance? If the legend of the war and truce between the Vanir and the Aesir gods had any basis in history, we have to consider when this could have happened and where. Thor Heyerdahl believed that it happened someplace in Eastern Europe, basing himself on certain place names that resemble place names mentioned by Snorri. But then, why is the event only remembered in Scandinavia? We don't know, but let us ask who exactly the newcomers from Asia encountered when they came up here. They would have encountered at least two different kinds of Neolithic cultures existing in Scandinavia at the time. The hunter-gatherers, who became the ancestors of the Sami people, and the megalithic farmers. Yes, we had megaliths here in Scandinavia too, especially in Denmark and southern Sweden. And I've already said something about that culture. They were communal, clan-based, there was equality between the members of the clans, within the clans, and they followed a matrilineal law of descent when, where men moved into their wives' families and ancestral mothers were the focus of ancestral worship. In the Norse sources, the Vanir are described as exceedingly wise, a lot wiser than the Aesir. They are the know-alls whose magic was powerful enough to withstand the Aesir attack where no one else had succeeded. They were seen as great magicians. Indeed, it was the goddess of the Vanir who taught Odin how to master the art of Seidr. So, in my personal opinion, without claiming any scientific proof, I would say that the Vanir of the legend could represent the megalith builders of the Scandinavian Stone Age, inheritors of a grand tradition of an astronomical and architectural science that we today still find completely mystifying. How did they build the megaliths? So if we find them mystifying, knowing all the things we know, imagine what they must have appeared like to a tribe of um, barbarians, to their contemporaries, to the barbarian invaders, who for all their warrior aristocratic bravado, these guardians of the megaliths must have appeared to be exceedingly well versed in mysteries and magic. If the legends are to be believed, the newcomers were certainly impressed and sought to be initiated into the mysteries of the native Scandinavian megalith builders. I think it's actually quite remarkable that in the Norse worldview there were three great tribes of power beings, the Esir, the Vanir and the Jotnir. They could all represent a legendary version of the three cultures that actually did coexist during the late Scandinavian Stone Age and into the Bronze Age. Uh, one, the invading warrior culture from the southeast, two, the megalith farmers, and three, the hunter-gatherers. 
By the time of the Bronze Age in Scandinavia, the megalith farmers had indeed merged with the invading culture, whereas the hunter-gatherers maintained a separate identity and became the Sami people. And this could be reflected in the legend of how the Esir and the Vanir people merged, whereas the Jotnir remained a separate tribe associated with the wilderness. We also know that the new invading culture brought with them the ancient Indo-European thunder god. They may also have brought with them the cult of a sacred king who impersonated one of their most important gods, Vudan, or Odin, or at least his predecessor, who was seen as a descendant of the thunder god. Later, we know that Odin became the All-Father and the father of the Thunder God, but in earlier times the descent was reversed. This reversal may have happened quite late, because uh, in the year 80 AD, Tacitus claimed that the German tribes believed that the Thunder God was their ancestor, their All-Father. So Odin sort of swapped place with Thor. Uh, anyway, this culture of, thun uh, of the thunder god and the divine king god merged with the megalith farmer culture who may have worshipped a goddess, the Varnadis, which literally means the goddess of the Varnir, and according to the legend she had three male companions, her father Njord, her brother Freyr, and her mysterious protector and hero Heimdallir, the god of the universe, who returned a fiery jewel to the goddess. Odin and the Thunder God may have merged with, these, um, with two of these three companions, leaving only two original Vanir gods in the ancient formula of one goddess and three gods. The original Vanir gods in the formula was Freya and Freyr, who are significantly siblings from the original Vanir tribe. By the time of the Bronze Age, the great goddess of the Vanir was probably worshipped in the shape of the sun goddess, surrounded by her brother, the sword god, and the two newcomers with their axes and spears, Thor and Odin, who in many ways blend easily with respectively Njord and Heimdallr. Um, if there is any historical truth in the legend, as I have now suggested, although it would be difficult to prove for certain, it is quite interesting to note that Snorri described the prototypical Odin as a prototypical king god married to a clairvoyant priestess goddess. This brings us into the Iron Age and the first known temples dedicated to Vodan, the Iron Age predecessor of Odin. Now, this part uh, of the talk is based on the work by the historian Michael Enright in his book Lady with a Mead Cup, Ritual, Prophecy and Lordship in the European War Band from Laterna to the Viking Age. Um, in this book, Enright points out that the earliest representations of Wodan as, uh, is as a sacred king god married to a clairvoyant goddess called Rosmerta. Shrines to this divine couple were erected almost 2,000 years ago in Western Europe. Rosmerta means the great provider, which brings to mind one Norse goddess, Gefjon, whose name means the provider. And a short form of the name, name Gefjon is Gef, Gefn, which Snorri says is one of Freya's names. And we know that Frigg and Freya were once the same goddess and that uh, both were married to Odin. So are there any other indications that the Iron Age Rosmerta, the great provider, could be associated with Freya or other Norse goddesses? Indeed, Rosmerta, like Freya, is depicted in the shrines as a clairvoyant oracle goddess who owns a necklace, carries a cultic staff or wand, um, and whose central function is the serving of sacred mead. She is the prototypical divine witch priestess of Norse and Celtic religions. So where did Rosmerta come from? Where in the name Rosmerta this goddess came from the Celtic region and was earlier married to the Celtic god Lug. In regions where there were a lot of uh, Roman influence, Lug's place as Rosmerta's consort is taken by the Roman god Mercury. And in the German regions, Mercury's and Lug's place by Rosmerta's side is Wodan, their old Odin. So this means that the earliest hard evidence for a Wodan cult 2000 years ago emphasizes his role as a king in sacred marriage to a divine priestess. So how old is the institution of sacred marriage? Well, um, there is plenty of evidence for a sacred marriage cult in Scandinavia already during the Bronze Age. Marriage scenes 
uh, or let us say ritual sex scenes, that is, a sexual act is depicted surrounded by religious symbolism and images of people performing ritual movements around the couple. And these Im images abound in Bronze Age art. But where do they abound? They are found close to sacred places and groves, but most of them are actually find, found within graves. This is why these sex scenes are not interpreted as Bronze Age pornography, despite all their explicitness. They are clearly depictions of a sacred act, the Hieros Gamos, or sacred marriage between two deities or between a human and his goddess. So we do not know if the Bronze Age sac sacred marriage was associated with kingship, but it is very likely. Moving a bit forward to the Iron Age, especially towards the 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th centuries AD in Northern Europe, there is new evidence for a bloom in the ancient ritual of sacred marriage in connection to kingship inauguration. One Norwegian professor of Norse mythology, Gro Steinsland, has shown how the memory of the sacred marriage and kingship cult is strongly present in Norse myths. Comparing these to similar Celtic myths and to other religions where the sacred marriage was an institution already 5,000 years ago, such as in ancient Sumer, a picture emerges. When kingship was introduced in Europe during the Late Stone Age and Early Bronze Ages, a new institution was established almost everywhere. The sacred marriage, where a king, in order to be accepted by his people as their king, had to be accepted by the goddess of the land and marry her. The goddess represented both the land and the people living in the land. She was their ancestral mother, their provider. The king was responsible for keeping the goddess happy. If she was satisfied in her marriage, she would provide abundance and make her children happy. If she was unsatisfied with her husband, she would withdraw the bounty of the land and send famine, war and pestilence onto her children. The lady basically had to be pleased. Uh, so, thus, the people had to choose a king carefully, one who could please her and inspire her to create abundance and prosperity, peace and happiness. In ancient Sumer, a great deal of emphasis was placed on the king's ability to please the goddess sexually. He had to offer her many gifts, prostrate before her, sing her praises, raise a throne to her, seduce her with caresses and loving words, and when she had consented to wed him, she would bed him. And many of the oldest religious hymns ever written down in our world are detailed and very explicit descriptions of how the Sumerian goddess finds pleasure in her husband during sacred marriage. And the funniest thing for us is that this all happened on stage with thousands of onlookers, the goddess being represented by a priestess. And uh, the pleasure of the goddess was emphasized in the hymns as something great, beautiful and sacred. Because when the goddess thrived in this way, she would automatically bring forth bounty. As she was enjoying herself, the flowers would bloom, the fields would grow and good fortune and prosperity would come to the people. And if the crops failed, if there was pestilence, if the king failed to protect the peace by holding back enemies, it would be said that he was a bad husband for the goddess. And there are several indications that he would be sacrificed. So, is this ancient Mesopotamian tradition in any way relevant to the northern ritual of sacred marriage and kingship? There are indeed many parallels, but we do not know as many details. Uh, we do not know as many details because, unlike the Sumerians, the Scandinavians had not yet invented writing. So apparently, the institution of sacred marriage had dwindled by the late Viking Age, if not even earlier. And the only texts we have are much younger than that. But there are quite a few indications, such as the sacrifice of a king, uh, which certainly happened in Scandinavia when there was famine in the land. Um, then the body part of the sacrificed king would be brought around the land with the hope that the land would provide once more. And there is also a very significant story about a king who rode ritually in a circle around the Disar Salin, which means the temple of the goddess. During the great Disating, the parliament of the goddesses, which was the name of the annual assembly at Uppsala in Sweden during the Viking Age, the king had to show his worth by circling the temple of the goddess, and if his horse stumbled or he fell off, he was no longer favoured by the goddess and no longer fit to rule. 
So I and many others believe that the Scandinavian sacred marriage in connection to kingship is powerfully related to the much older Mesopotamian ritual. And it is thought that the idea spread from there and into Europe during the Bronze Age, which would explain why the rituals are so similar everywhere. The only thing that makes the Nodjan tradition stand out as different from the Sumerian, as far as I know, is the emphasis on a drinking ritual in connection to the sacred marriage, as I've been talking about before. The drinking ritual is probably particular to an Indo-European tradition, known to the Celts and the Norse and German cultures, with clear connection to Soma, the sacred drink of the Indian Vedas, and to Hauma, the sacred drink of the Iran Iranian Avesta texts. These ancient Indo-European traditions blended with the originally Mesopotamian ritual of sacred marriage as the ritual became established all over Europe during the Bronze Age. My guess is that the ritual of sacred marriage is a result of the emergence of a warrior aristocracy who wanted the people to be ruled and protected by a strong military leader, the king, and in order to legitimize kingship the power of one man over many people. The king had to prove that he was worthy of leading the people by being accepted and loved by the goddess on whom the people depended for, for their fortune and for their prosperity. So as long as the king managed to keep the people happy, it was seen as the blessings of the goddess and as a proof that the king incarnated the husband brother of the goddess. Now, um, in the beginning, the kings of Sumer were quite humble in their role. They were titled uh, not as kings actually, but as the overseers and the caretakers of the goddess, like men who ruled under her guidance, a bit like caretakers of the land on behalf of the goddess. And as long as he pleased the goddess, she would provide. The king was elected by the people in Sumer, as he later was in Northern Europe. Yes, the kings were elected by the parliaments even towards the end of the Viking Age, and both the Sumerian and the Norse king knew that if he failed to please his people, protect them, secure the peace and inspire fertility in the goddess of the land, he would be sacrificed and another would replace him. Uh, in both cultures, power relations changed over time and the king gradually became a little bit more secure in their possessions, but the age-old ritual of sacred marriage continued as a powerful symbol of why the king was allowed to rule and this was going on for thousands of years. In order to pro prove his worth, uh, Saga and Edda sources strongly suggest that the king had to go through a series of trials, a great initiation, before he could be accepted by the parliament and voted in. A king was expected to be a semi-divine uh, person. He would incarnate the god and possess secret esoteric knowledge, as it is said in the Riksdula poem. En konar unger kunni runer. Ah, fin runar och alde runar. Mer kunni han monnum bjarga, äggar daifa, ägi lägga. Meaning, and King Yong knew the runes, the runes of fate and the runes of the ages. More he knew, he could save the people, he could blunt the blades and heal the wounds. And this stanza shows us the kind of things a king in Scandinavia was expected to know and be able to do. He had to be like a priest or a sorcerer in his knowledge of runes and secret mysteries. He had to go through the same initiations at them. He had to be able to throw spells and to protect his people and he had to be able to heal. He had to display this kind of knowledge before the king, uh, that is, before the parliament, before he could expect them to vote him in as a king. And he had to maintain the happiness of the people, symbolized in his marriage to the ancestral mother goddess. And if he failed, he would be sacrificed. So uh, when we hear about Odin's own trials before he could take up his seat among the gods, we realize that er there are many things uh, that are written down as myth, which draws from real life and actual history. So um, that's it for today. Uh, yeah, have a lovely day.